stuff for so long. But, you know, I'm here again because of this thing. <laughs> Pokemon. Pokemon. When I heard that coming out of the rise, I'm like, don't, don't think about it. Don't think about it. But I thought about it every single day until it came out. And what happened? Download the app, walked out into the real world, and caught Pokemon in the middle of summer in Arizona. What the heck is going on here? Why would a game motivate me, a gamer, who usually sits on front of the TV as a couch potato, get out and play a video game? But Pokemon made me do that because I loved Pokemon when I was growing up. I loved the card game, I loved the, uh, the Game Boy game, and the cartoon too. So all those different elements made me, compelled me to download that game. Compelled me to download that game and play it. <sighs> So, anybody here not know about Pokemon Go by now? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's one of those games that like you know hit mainstream media big time. So like you know, it's not like some game that like you know that some people talk about like World of Warcraft, okay, or or uh, even less obscure data of uh, the Destiny of the Agents. No, or has anybody heard of um, of um, Fortnite? <laughs> No, don't walk that way. Okay. Fortnite, yes, another major phenomenon. And I have not touched that game. I will not touch that game. I know better now. <laughs> anybody know anybody who has touched that game? Yes. Oh gosh, look at that. Actually, I want to get a picture of that. You know. Show of hands. Show of hands of how many. Okay, so if, who you, if you know somebody who has touched. Fortnite, oh, oh my gosh, oh gosh, oh my gosh. Interest. This is an epidemic, <laughs> totally an epidemic, my goodness. Total phenomena, that game has taken the, the kids and adults by storm. So, um, anybody else here want to admit that you're a gameaholic? Oh, a few, the proud, <laughs> the addicted. Okay, so, so, so you're here because you're trying to figure out why I'm addicted so that you can feel better about yourself, right? <laughs> now, so, so, you know, so for those of you who are addicted, you definitely know the power of the game. But so for those of you who are not, you're probably just wondering what is wrong with me. <laughs> so, so you know, all kidding inside, you know, we're here to talk about a serious subject. So I'm going to go over a little quick agenda here. We're going to talk about understanding the gamer because for the vast majority here in the room, it's not part of what you grew up with. It's not something that you're in, in, ingrained in. And you're looking out from the outside in and go, why are they doing this Fortnite thing? Or why are they walking out in the middle of summer in the heat and, and dying of, of, of heat stroke trying to keep, catch Pokemon? So I'm going to go over that. Uh, a little brief history of video games and how it evolved in the past few decades. Video gaming as an addiction, yes, you know, and actually recently in the past uh, three weeks, uh, 
who, the World Health Organization, not the Doctor Who, <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, actually classified that as a disorder. So you know, it's it's finally happened. I mean, for for the five years that I've talked about this, I'm like, they gotta make it a real thing, and they finally did. They listened to me. <laughs> um, and the biggest thing is how this addiction and these video games affect education and you as educators here in this room. Uh, we're going to talk about the culture of gaming because if you understand the culture a little bit more, kind of like if you go and lived in, like, you know, I spent some time in Argentina, so I understood uh, the culture down there a lot better by immersion. You know, we're going to try to get you there, just a little primer. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll immerse you in Fortnite. <laughs> Um, and basically, you know, uh, and why I'm here because, like, you know, my sub matter expertise is uh, in gamification and education, and and one of the big uh, pet projects that we've been working on is gamifying mathematics and making kids addicted to math. Can you can you, leave it? Can you get kids addicted to math? <laughs> so we actually did. It's actually pretty cool. So a little history about myself uh, because you're probably wondering, like, you know. How, how, how's this kid up here talking like an expert about education and gaming? Um, it's because I had a lot of experience. <laughs> so I had a lot of disadvantages growing up in, uh, as a kid. Um, one of the biggest ones was when I was made in Taiwan. <laughs> yes, go ahead and laugh. You know, this is a, this is a, a fun sharing experience. Remember, this is Gameaholics Anonymous, so, so there's, there's no uh, wrong answer. So uh, it was made in Taiwan. And, I was exported here when I reckoned at the age of two into my family's Chinese restaurant. So they immigrated here and wanted to live the American dream. So we opened up a restaurant. Um, it was really hard uh, growing in a restaurant because if you know any families who own restaurants, it's, uh, they don't make a lot of money. Uh, that's a huge disadvantage because like, you know, uh, we were growing up free and reduced even though we had a food restaurant, <laughs> but we didn't make a lot of money. But uh, in addition to that, um, we, I had reading problems. Uh, was English as a second language. I had to go through two years of specialty speech classes so I could speak to you as eloquently as I am today. <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and I had problems reading. So whenever I uh, would read, were to read a textbook, like the words would like go in one eye and out the other because my brain spent so much power trying to process those words, I just didn't have any time for, to comprehend it. So, so I had a lot of problems reading. I just could not read and comprehend. And the other big problem, ADHD. <laughs> I had a lot of energy when I was a kid, um, and my parents had to deal with it. But um, anybody know anyone with ADHD in this room here? Okay, I'm surprised that not all of you, call your hands up because you know somebody who has that. All of our kids have that. So because I had such a disadvantage uh, youth growing up, we were poor, we didn't have a lot of, uh, of money and internet access, like, um, oh, I even had failed a math class, which is really funny, because I'm Chinese, seriously. <laughs> I have slanky eyes and black hair. <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, seriously, it's like you know, all my peers like, were excellent at math, and I actually failed a class, because my brain was going so fast, I fell asleep in class half the time, so therefore I just, I just disengaged a lot. Um, but like I was saying, like, you know, we were disadvantaged that my parents couldn't put me on medicine, so they had to deal with me a lot. Um, so, in, so instead, you know, I had to deal with it naturally. I had to work with my disorder. I had to work with my problem. And, and what happened is I learned to cope with it, and I turned it into uh, my superpower, which I don't know, um, here. It gave me heightened senses. The ability to be able to see and process things in the world far faster than my peers could. Um, I was able to do multi-point perception, so you know, so I could look out and I could like notice things without even uh, subconsciously, without even realizing it. And then like you, you would ask me a question about something, I'm like, oh yeah, that was there, and that was. It's not identical, but it's close to it. It's just amazing how like you know, if you unlock your brain how much power you have behind it without even realizing it. Like, the less I think, the more I know. <laughs> uh, which made, like, might be perfect to become a video gamer, because video games, they throw tons of flashy things at you to hold your attention. So as I was growing up playing these video games, it held my attention and, uh, and really helped my brain develop that way. Uh, which I, then I taught myself programming, because uh, I thought, hey, I love games, I can make my own. But instead, I went to education and developed education gaming. <laughs> Um, and in uh, culinary arts and also now in mathematics. So, 
So that's my little brief history. So that's why I'm here because, like you know, I, I wanted to create a bridge between uh, my world and your world and uh, and have, help you understand that. So because we live in a world of instant gratification, hopefully the sound works because I didn't get a chance to test it. No. One sound. Okay, we're going to stick this in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. <laughs> I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. <laughs> season so so I love that clip because it really illustrates to, to us that like you know these kids are growing up without one of these things in their hands or some of us they would, without one of these, these things on our wrists uh, and we have access to information instantaneously they they'll never know a time where they can't just ask Siri something or ask Google something or Alexa something you know they, if they have a question they, they get the answer they don't have to go seek an adult they for God's sake, they don't have to go to a, what we have to do is relocate ourselves to a, what, what was that called again? <laughs> Library, yes. Uh, and then, then, you know, if we're looking for a book, what do we have to do to look for that book? We have to go into this big thing called a star catalog. And then you have to uh, sort through that thing, and sometimes you get a paper cut when you're looking for it. Ouch! That's painful. And then you find the card, you go to the, where the book is, and you go, darn it, it's not there, because it got misfiled, now it's lost forever. Or even worse, like for some of us who had experience going down into the stacks, grabbing that little piece of film called a Microfish. microfish. <laughs> Putting in that machine and dr scrolling through all those articles until you found that one and you go, this is almost the right article, I'm going to base my entire research off of it because I just spent 18 hours trying to find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's never like that again, so, so gosh, wasn't it good reminiscing? <laughs> so they'll never know that. They always know that information is right there. So where did it all start? Um, with this. Palm. Um, you know, it's so simple now. You got a little dot moving up left and right. You got these things moving up and down. You know, it's so simple. But the significance of it is, for the very first time in human history, we as people got to manipulate a digital asset, not a tangible one, a digital asset. So what that did was it unlocked our minds, our creative minds to, to develop things that we never imagined before. So because of that one little thing that you could do this manipulative on has unleashed a torrent of advancements in the video game, starting from simplistic levels to more complicated uh, quest adventures to reactionary games where you had to hit yourself and get skills against another two super reactions on Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, where you have this hedgehog screaming across the screen at a million miles per hour, and how the heck does somebody process that information? Well, we can, actually. And then on July 6, 2016, Pokemon Go came out. Now, that was significant, because before, gaming happened in the house or on the console. For the most part, you did not leave your, your place. You did not have to go explore the real world. So what it did was it moved the gaming world into the real world for the very first time. And it's quite amazing, you know, that, like for me, in the middle of summer where it was 110 degrees outside, catching Pokemon. Yeah. And I go to these parks, which is usually desolate in the middle of the night. And you had crowds and crowds of people. It was like the most bizarre thing I've ever seen, and I was a part of it. Uh, so I don't need to describe this because, but the cool thing is like 45 million users downloaded it in the first month. It was that popular. Um, and in fact, like, you know, this is a funny clip here where we have uh, people saying, hey, look, there's a Pokemon down there. Uh, it's a Charizard. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Oh, sorry, man. Oh. <laughs> Didn't see you there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's just crazy the lengths that people do uh, for this game. Uh, and look, they're not kids. They're adults. <laughs> they're adults playing this game. Uh, unfortunately, the, the video is so washed out that you can't see it very well. 
Uh, and then Fortnite came out. The next game changer, like 2018, like so many people have downloaded that game and are playing it. Uh, it's just incredible how, how fast it's adopted. Um, and, it's, 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 and the gaming world is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and even more invasive as we go. So uh, let me just uh, start with like, you know, are there any gamers in here? Oh, we already have a few enthusiastic people. But let's start with the first category, arcade. Anybody start out in the arcade world where you have to physically relocate yourself to a smoky bar <laughs> or a pizza parlor, pop in a corner, and then play those games, and you actually had those scoreboards written up in the bar? Yeah, good old time. So back then, you know, in order to play these games, you had to go someplace. And then you had to um, be social, actually, when you're doing that, which is cool. Then we had the console. Now we brought it into the house where it's less social. But then you had your friends. Right? Anybody here started out in the game console era? Atari, Nintendo. So we should see a lot more uh, people exposed to that uh, and whatnot. You know, Playstations, Xbox. So the PC gamers came out in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. So these PCs, which were supposed to be productivity machines to spread, to calculate spreadsheets and do word processing, were turned into game machines. So anybody are PC gamers here? Okay, there's a hardcore, hardcore gamers, PC gamers. Yeah, I love it. Um, SimCity was my intro drug there. <laughs> Portable gaming. So now instead of like, you know, being tied to a desk or a physical location, you can actually walk around and play on a Game Boy. Any uh, portable gamers here? PlayStation, Vita, not PlayStation, no, PSP, Game Boy. Okay, a few of you there. And then now, who has a smartphone? You are all potential gamers. <laughs> so with the smartphone, I've made it ubiquitous so that everybody can be a gamer now. You don't have to have any specialized hardware, any devices. All you need is a phone and an app store, and you're done. And then solitaire, if you play solitaire, you're a gamer. So <laughs> you're just a, a closet gamer. You're just solitaire. <laughs> so, I, uh, so this it, it, uh, graphic is very, very important. I came up with this uh, 10 years ago, actually. Um, and it's, it's, it's very, it, it illustrates some very uh, stark things about how entertainment affects our, our youth. Um, so over there on the left, yeah, we have cartoon characters. So back when uh, some of you were growing up, you know, <laughs> your parents said, okay, everyone, uh, you know, go and be quiet and go watch, sit in front of TV and watch the, the Mickey Mouse show or the Smurfs or Felix the Cat, for any of you out there. <laughs> Um, so basically, you know, these kids are like, okay, you know, I'm gonna sit there, I'm gonna watch this show, I'm gonna be entertained by it, this is fun. You, they tell stories, you laugh with them, you cry with them, you become uh, emotionally invested in these characters as a kid. Then you grow up, you go to Disneyland, you have a great time, you find those silly Mickey Mouse ears, and you take horrible selfies and set, uh, post them on uh, Instagram. Um, but the thing is, like, you know, now as a kid, you know, you're becoming enamored by these characters, you have the emotional investment in them. And you're also learning that uh, sitting in front of TV and watching these cartoon characters is the appropriate way to absorb information. So you go to school, you're sitting in your nice new rows, the teacher's up front talking at you, and you're like, oh, okay, this makes sense. I'm going, as a kid, I grew up, I sat in front of TV, the TV, the, the tube was talking to me, and I have a teacher talking to me. This all makes sense. There's no, uh, nothing uh, uh, wrong with that. Uh, it's not, not disjointed at all. So that worked. So the education system worked really well in the 60s. I don't want to say well, but you know, it, 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 it was okay for like 60s, 70s, and 80s while we were sitting in these uh, factory uh, style education systems. And then things started to change when the gaming devices come out. So now, instead of sitting there passively watching these uh, cartoon characters, now you're emotionally invested in these characters. Like any Mario fans out here? Yeah, more. You know, did you know that in a recent study, uh, Mario is a, a bigger cultural icon than Mickey Mouse? More people in the world know Mario than they do Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So, so like a you know, Pokemon, like what I love, uh, like John Zelda Sonic. So now instead of like sitting there passively watching the entertainment, I am in control of these avatars' destinies. I make decisions. I can decide whether how well to go through a level, whether I want to just passively go through a level, or whether I want to master it, how many times I want to do that level. Sometimes I want to do it 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, so I want to beat my score. So, so now I have these decisions. Uh, to make and uh, making decisions on, on how well I do. And then you go to these classroom and you sit in nice neat rows and teach talking at you and you say, oh, when I was a kid, 
I had this little controller thing, I was making decisions, and now I have no choice. What am I going to do? They're just, oh, I have to listen? I don't want to make decisions. I want to choose how I, how I make my way through this uh, level, but I can't. Oh, well, I guess I'll just go to sleep then. <laughs> so, so this really, this, this aspect of the controller has really changed how uh, our kids expect things. And now with the smartphone, it's changing even more. So those expectations are changing drastically. <clears throat> so does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And I, so, so now as, now we have to look at it because now the, addic the addiction's been made public. Um, let's pretend that it is a widespread Fortnite epidemic. Uh, so in a recent study, 97% of youth two, surveyed two through seven said that they have touched a video game. And I bet you it's probably Fortnite now. Uh, so that represents 64 million uh, kids in America alone that could be users. Uh, we also found that the, uh, the age segment of two through five are the fastest growing. And why is that? The smartphone and tablets. Before, you had, if you wanted to play video games, you had to actually have some manual dexterity. You had to actually be able to convert a controller and buttons into actions on the screen. But now, all you have to do is just see it, touch it, see it, move it, see it. And that is a natural human expression. So no training is necessary to be uh, addict. And in fact, China has intern, uh, internet boot camps um, for addiction. So they take these kids and they, they grab them away from their uh, computer desk, like put a, put a mask on them and ship them away to a boot camp and put them in a militaristic style, like, you know, um, um, uh, environment for about a month, hoping, hoping to break, break their addictions. In fact, kids have died playing video games. It's a very well documented fact in China. Fortunately, it hasn't happened here yet, right? <laughs> so why is this so addicting? You know, this is very important. Now, first off, it's a temporary escape. You know, so people play these games because we're in the real world and it's not as fun as the video game world. But the other thing is it's social and anonymous at the same time. So you're, you're, you're whoever you want to be, but you're, called, you're also working with other people in the same like-mindedness. Now, these next two ones uh, can be uh, applied to uh, education, which is it's challenging and there's a goal in mind. So every single game has a goal and there's a challenge re uh, represented to each set goal. And the last one here, constant measurable growth. Very important. So in the video game, you're constantly being measured, you're constantly being scored, you're constantly being uh, um, given timestamps, uh, achievements, and things like that. All these things are happening on a real-time basis, and that hits a reward system, a dopamine system in our brain, where it's getting, and it's getting hit. Just like you know, if you're playing like you know, uh, slots in the in a uh, uh, in Vegas or something like that. They program all that stuff to hit our reward centers. So, you know, remember the title here, Ready Player One? Anybody see that movie here? Oh, cool, more and more, well, I'm happy, more of you than I, than I thought. The uh, last time I gave a session, no hands went up. What? <laughs> I love that movie. So I actually read the book first. In fact, I was talking about the book in this session for the past uh, four years, and then the movie came out. So now I can use this clip. If, for those of you who don't know this movie. My tiny home out of nowhere. There's nowhere left to go. Nowhere. Except the oasis. future could be, <laughs> but uh, um, in fact, some of it is uh, based on reality. But realistically, you know, the elements in this movie are true to life. You know, escapism, you know, being what you can be or what you want to be, um, being anything you want. So, 
Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, it's a great movie. Go rent it. I'm not, uh, not plugging it, but uh, but I'll say it's great. Um, so let's look at this. Uh, so let's translate the uh, the gaming addiction to Maslow's hierarchy of gaming needs. So first off, um, it provides us a sense of belonging through social interactions. That's a very big need. In, uh, self esteem. You know, it, as we overcome obstacles, our self esteem grows. The challenges that we face, we we grow, grow in self esteem, and self actualization. You know, this is a very big part of like uh, video games and addiction. So they're actually contributing to a living world. So they feel like they're giving something back and, and they're, what they're doing has meaning. So these th different needs are being satisfied by video games and making it addictive. Um, yeah, uh, so then, okay, there we go. Um, there's a, a pad of paper being passed around the room. Um, where is it at right now? So what I'm doing is I'm just collecting emails and I'm going to be sending out a, uh, uh, the PowerPoint and the videos that I'm using uh, in this PowerPoint to, uh, and also I'm recording it so you can relive this moment and over and over again and share it with your friends um, so that uh, uh, we can get that to you. So pass it around and uh, sign it if you like. Uh, I promise you I won't spam you. I'll send you one email, really one email. Um, that is if I can read your handwriting. <laughs> Okay, so video games is a multi-billion dollar industry, and that also reminded me that I want to do a panorama of this room because I think it's pretty cool. So everyone, wave your hands in the air and, and pretend you're, you're having fun. There you go. Uh, good pretending there. All right. Oh, I see a smile. Okay, great. Oh, okay. Oh, fun. Oh, no frowning. Sorry. Okay. All right. We're done. <laughs> Thank you. So. Um, so this is really cool because, uh, now this is not cool, because the, the, city, the video game industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. All right, so I watched the Super Bowl, not for the game, but for the ads. <laughs> and uh, and there, at, during the Super Bowl 2015, there was an ad featured, uh, featuring a game over here. Um, you can see the little small things. It's a, it's a mobile ad. I, the game doesn't actually look like this, but what really struck me as unusual was that a Mobile game. This is the first time I've ever seen a, a, a video game or mobile game advertised in the Super Bowl. Usually you expect cars, beer, movie trailers, uh, Budweiser uh, um, courses, things like that. But there we have Liam Neeson promoting a free game on it on a uh, on on the mobile phone called Clash of Clans. So I'm like, wow, a mobile game can afford a Super Bowl ad because. You know, you don't do Super Bowl ads if you're just like this small company, especially gaming companies, they don't make a lot of money, right? So there's Liam Neeson. So, um... You probably can't get the audio back there, but that's okay. So Clash of Clans, I played a game. I've been playing it for about five years now, uh, and I still do. Um, makes uh, about one million, one hundred something thousand dollars, but that's a figure that's given in a daily basis. Wow, and it's only a team of, well back then it was about 30 people in, in, uh, in Norway. Now they're probably about 80 people, but a uh, but small team of people making this simple little game, making that much money. Wow, now, so let's put that in contrast. Uh, so the video game industry measured last year was $109 billion. That's a lot of money, right? All right, so how much did the movie industry make last year uh, here in the United States? A, a wild guess, wild guess. It goes, huh? Huh? 10 million. 10 million? Anyone else? 56 million? All right. Good job. Okay, let, let's see. Oh, wait, oh, you were close. You win a prize. <laughs> 11 billion dollars. Yes, with Star Wars, uh, Last Jedi figures in there, um, and, uh, and all the Marvel movies, 11 billion dollars. That's it? <laughs> 11 billion dollars compared to the video game industry. So, so the reason I put that up because where do things get developed? Where the money goes? So that means that the games are here to stay and they'll get worse and worse because they want more addicts. They want more people to feed the machine. So Fortnite, this is interesting. You know, in an article from New York Times, this is a great article if you want to write it down. It's, it's a parenting uh, uh, guide to Fortnite. Uh, but basically, in the article, it said it's, it is built to be addicted, addictive. 
So, you know, they hire psychologists and all these different specialists to figure out all the little things to make it even more fun and more addicting. Okay, you got any pictures? You got any pictures? All right. <laughs> all right. Have anyone here heard of East Coast Arenas? Cool, a few of you. So, so these are popping up all over the world now. So video gaming is so popular, they're actually converting old abandoned malls, movie theaters, even sports arenas, <laughs> into e-sports arenas. So where a bunch of people come all together, bring their devices and game stations and whatnot, and they all have this giant, massive uh, 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 video game uh, uh, competition. Um, in fact, it's so popular that you can be a pro gamer and make six figures from playing, from winnings and sponsorships now. It is, because, hey, if you have $109 billion to throw around, you could, throw, uh, you could make some uh, good advertising out of that. So in fact, uh, with eSports arenas, like right here, it says, you know, the Paris Olympics in 2014 is even considering putting it in as a demonstration sport now. Isn't that crazy? Because they, what they're doing is that um, more people are watching these gamers on screen on Twitch. Have you ever heard of Twitch before? Yeah, Twitch is a streaming service, kind of like YouTube, but just for gamers. And one gamer playing Fortnite one day got 500,000 real-time views. That's 500,000 people watching him play a video game all around the world. Just one guy. So now they're considering that to drive up their attendance. Oh wait, never mind, not 500, 638,000 to watch Drake. <laughs> Crazy, New York Times article. Um, so here, I'm here because like, you know, my whole purpose here is to build empathy. Uh, so you have had empathy with your kids as they're growing up because you know, the more you know about these kids uh, growing up playing these uh, horribly addictive games uh, that you know, when they get up to a, a junior high and high school, they're, you know, they're also dysfunctional uh, trying to get them to learn. Um, of course. <laughs> but I love this one better. Yes, knowing is half the battle. It is. Joe said so. <laughs> um, so, so you know, building this bridge so that uh, you can have a better understanding of. Now, so one thing I'm going to show you is like you know, witnessing the power of gamification. Uh, worked with a group of kids, um, you know, at-risk youth, highest crime, highest poverty kids. They asked them what's like five plus four. You know, what do they do? And I go nine. You know, you know any kids like that? You know any adults like that? <laughs> That's because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a habit that they learned when they were in kindergarten, first grade, and they never got out of it, you know, to be able to do mental math. So in order to get out of that, you have to know the math facts, right? You have to be able to understand how to do um, arithmetic, algebra. So this is a kid, a uh, fifth grader, that we worked with, uh, and we created a math game you can see here. He has one minute to answer, as many math problems as he can. Um, now the key is uh, um, trying to motivate him to answer these questions. Oops, and why is not playing? There you go. He's solving for X. <laughs> so during that minute, he's answering all those questions. Now, in order to get fluent in anything, you have to practice a lot. He answers anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 questions a day in uh, a given level. There's 750 levels that he levels up through. And it gets progressively harder as he um, moves up the, the ladder. So, so here it is at this level. Isn't that crazy? So we gamified math, made it fun, so that he could become fluent in math. So, 
So we made an injection, and this happened in less than uh, um, 80 days. 80 days of doing a 15 minute exercise every morning, one minute round, so he usually does like nine, sometimes 10 if he can pull it off. Um, but that, that, that talk about like, you know, building, building blocks in the brain. It's because, you know, our brains are so powerful that, that we, we, we could do that. We just need the tools to do that. So in fact, I'm going to show you this here. So here he is. Uh, now this is significant. Uh, Twenty days later, he's doing these like word problems, and he's doing it at speed. Look at that. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit here. Now I pause it. So it's not. These, and he's answering them all correctly. That's because the previous five levels, we just slowly introduced words to him, so that when he hit that level, he actually is able to put all the pieces together and answer all these questions correctly. Wow. And uh, you know, I have to watch more of this, but but you also see that like the you know, way it interspersed other levels, so uh, so it mixes up up and down. We have forward pressure and back pressure. In any case, so we do this in uh, less than nine weeks. Um, then one of the reasons why is because we have this in front of class. It's a leaderboard. Ooh, leaderboards in class, bad, bad. <laughs> I know, but when you use it right, it becomes a powerful tool. So now the kids see this goal move across the screen as a class. So this is a class goal. So everyone is part of the team. It's a team sport. We're making them all part of this group, this tribe. So everyone's doing math. And now here, these are my individual achievements. So I'm making my own progress across. And this kid here has 1,600 points that they have to contribute. This kid here, no, only 200. They're contributing at their own level. That kid might be at level uh, uh, 42, this kid might be at level 26 or something like that on the, on the scale. And you know, 25,652 uh, points, everyone go. And then they go, go crazy and, and, and move forward with that. In fact, like, you know, it's so crazy that, like, you know, that they love it because what we're doing is we're catering to the accelerated mind. Their minds are so plastic, uh, plastic, plastic that, that they have the ability to be able to do that. And their mind is going so fast that they can process it. In fact, like, you know, now, uh, with all the, the video games and everything that, that we throw at the kids, we're teaching them to process things so much faster. And when we tell them to take information slowly, it's like, you know, if you're flying a plane and you go too slow, you, what happens? You stall out and you fall. You have to maintain a certain velocity to be able to stay aloft. And we're basically telling them, hey, slow down, take this information slower. But I'm disconnecting. Oh, I'm losing, losing altitude. Oh, I'm going to crash. And that's what happens, and then they fall asleep. So, so, but, the, but then we worry about giving them too fast enough. But in video games, which I'm going to tell you in a minute here, uh, why? You are learning through repetition, so you're getting a little more each time. It's not one pass gets you to 100%, it's eight passes gets you to 100%. So, think about that. In fact, you know. But honestly, like once you get in there and you just get going, you completely forget that you're even doing math. It's honestly just really fun. And the whole class looks forward to it every day. We beg our teacher, we're like, oh, let's do it. Like, yeah, so it's not math anymore. It's fun. It's crazy. All right, so, so this is a special pilot that we started this year. And, and if you are interested in becoming one of our special pilot schools, we want you to play with it. Uh, uh, we we're, we're in like high schools, middle schools, uh, obviously grade schools, um, EP programs, um, uh, intervention programs now. Um, but we're gathering a lot of data on, 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 on this new behavior that, and, and we're actually breaking new ground. Teachers are telling us new things that we have never even thought about that's happening to these kids now that they're gaming math addicts. All right, so I'm actually doing a full talk on that with uh, my fellow researcher, John Hoopenthal, who is the guy who came up with all the uh, intricate theories to make, the, uh, make those elements come together at 2.15 in this room. So if you want to come and go through this again, <laughs> Um, please do. Uh, have a colleague who's a math teacher or a principal who does works with math come on in and uh, and check it out. So um, let's understand their language a little bit. First off, we have this concept called grinding. Okay. So what does grinding mean to you? 
But <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of chuckles. I know. Get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> All right. All right. Do we need any skateboarders here? Any skateboarders? Any skaters? Um, um, basically, what grinding is, it's a mechanic in a video game uh, developer puts in to make uh, somebody do something um, repetitively to. Uh, level up basically. A very good example of it was a game I played a long time ago called EverQuest. So in that game, did I activate Siri by accident? <laughs> uh, in that game, yeah, I had uh, I had to learn a skill called fishing. So then what I would do is I would go to the lake and I would hit the fishing button, and then I would do the fish, and then it would say fail, darn. Hit the button, fail, darn. Hit the button again, fail, darn. Hit the button, fail, success. Woo! -hoo! One one experience point. Yay! I do that for an hour, I get to level two. Does that sound like fun to you? <laughs> no, it was not. Uh, and then I make it to level two. Then I spend another two hours to make it to level three, and another five hours to make, to make it to level five. Wow, I've already invested like eight hours into this uh, stupid fishing task. Well, that's because at level five, I can go buy the golden fishing rod from the merchant because he won't let me touch it until I get to that level. So at level five, I go pick up the golden fishing rod, I go back to the lake, and I fish again. And I'm fishing for another 10 hours to make it to level 10. Then I get the platinum rod, which enables me to go to the mysterious lake of mystery to catch the rainbow trout. Because I can't catch the rainbow trout with the level 5 pole or a level 1 pole. I have to get the level 10 pole. So I go ahead and do that for another like uh, 5 to 8 hours. And eventually I do catch that fish. And I get to level uh, 17 or something like that. Because of that fish, like lets me take it to the to the armorer so that he can create this uh, the special shield for me to protect me against the rainbow dragon. <laughs> so now I can go attack the rainbow dragon without getting burned. Bingo. So wow, how many hours did I just spend to get that shield? About I don't know, 28 hours or so. But I got to the the goal. So, but I ground. I was doing that grinding motion over and over again because I had that goal in mind. So, so video games put, put that in there to basically, if you ever hear a kid say, I have to grind out that level, that means they're like, oh, okay, I have to go play it again so I can do get more points, more stats, or something like that. Uh, same thing with farming. Now, um, when they say I have to farm that level, uh, basically it's a, lar a larger version of grinding. So instead of doing one task over and over again, you're doing a series of tasks over and over again. And in a lot of cases, the, the levels don't change, so you're just doing it over and over again. Like if you're playing Super Mario uh, World 3-5, uh, anyone remember that one? <laughs> the, um, uh, you see like, the, the, the enemies don't change, the level doesn't change, but you're going through it uh, over and over again, or like, you know, if you're playing Diablo. So, um, so you're doing this whole thing, because what you're doing is you're doing the whole level, so you're getting experience, loot, and, uh, and what we call drops, which is basically special equipment and items so you can sell for good. So, so you're farming that level, because it's like farming, but you're doing it over and over again. Nothing new, nothing special, but you're getting better stuff. Speed run. Now speed run is interesting because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's becoming a big sport. Is you play a level once, and let's say you get through it in five minutes and 48 seconds. You're like, okay, I accomplished it. Then you look at your uh, internet leaderboard, you see that your friend Bob did it in five minutes and 32 seconds. And you're like, Bob, how the heck did you save off that time? And he's like, haha, I'm not gonna tell you, but check this out. <laughs> so then, then you go, oh, I didn't think about that. So, you go, so I go in and play that level again 18 times until I can shave off another like 15 seconds and then I post my new score. And I go, haha, I did it better than you. Uh, so, so basically, I'm playing this level, and every time I play it, I'm learning something new. I'm learning the behavior of this monster or this enemy will pop out at this second, so I can make this move like a half second like, faster to get around him and things like that. So I'm basically perfecting my moves across that level so that I can be better at it. And the level doesn't change, and I'm doing it over and over and over again because I want to be the fastest at that. That's a speed run. Now, Raid is really interesting because um, it's primarily uh, uh, in conjunction with World of Warcraft. Any WoWers here? Any? Oh, wow, you survived. I see that you, you don't have an ID stuck in you. Thank goodness. <laughs> I will not touch that thing with a 10 foot pole. I didn't even do a trial account. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, Raid is basically uh, uh, something that people do to go uh, hit a dungeon. But in order to do a Raid, in a lot of cases, uh, you have to do a lot of coordination. First, you're usually in a team of five or so. Uh, so you have to say, OK, everyone, get together at 7 PM. You, know, you might not even be in the same time zone, so we have to coordinate time. 
But on top of that, each person usually has a responsibility prior to the raid. So you go, hey, Joe, did you get the ancient mystic wand of, of, uh, of feathers? Because we need feathers. Um, and then you go, oh, no, I haven't done yet. So he, he goes off and does that quest. And then another person has to go get another quest. So they usually have to have these prerequisites before they can go in the dungeon to prepare for it. So they have to plan for it, they prepare for it, they all get together. And each person usually has to have a role. So you have a mage, you have a cleric, you have a fighter, you have, you have all these different like uh, roles to play. And everyone has to work in concert to defeat the dungeon. Because if you do it by yourself, you will die. But if you do it together, you'll most likely succeed and get the loot at the end. So that's a raid. It's a, it's a very cool concept. Now the last one here was what I call a 100 percenter or a perfectionist. Anybody here? Oh, oh yeah. So so you know the itch, right? The itch. Oh yeah, yeah. So 100 percenter has this like psychological disorder. <laughs> yeah. no, but but the thing is, it's like this drive to get everything in the game possible. So when you play most video games uh, nowadays, you finish the game and they'll say, congratulations, you have finished 52%. You're like, I just finished the game, why is it 52%? Well, it's because you didn't collect this item, you didn't go and explore this dungeon, you didn't find a secret passage, you know, all these other things, you didn't go on a side quest, you didn't do a, 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 a triple AV flip, double twist uh, with a grind. <laughs> like, like I know anything about skateboarding. but. Um, but the uh, but the, you have to do all these things to, to get these awards and achievements to become a 100 percenter. So a lot of kids have this um, drive, this need to do that because the games program them to them that you know you have to get 100 percent and you have to do it no matter what, right? You got the itch, you got the itch. Yeah, it's like this itch in the back of your head, like oh, I have to do this. <laughs> okay, so Fortnite. Yeah, so this is really interesting. This is another cool article uh, about Fortnite. Uh, just call, just Google teacher and parents share success stories uh, for Fortnite. Uh, you'll find it. But basically, let's say like you know, um, if you can relate video games into your classroom, you're gonna grab their attention so much more. Right now, Fortnite's the most relevant. Two a year ago was Pokemon. Um, so if you say, hey, you know, um, blah blah blah, Fortnite language, blah blah blah, you know, uh, then <laughs> then you will if that something will trigger in the brain. They like. What? Did you just say something relevant to me? <laughs> and then, uh, and then, and then you create a, a, a higher level of engagement. Just crazy. So you know, so I like to, uh, to correlate grinding with the uh, uh, education term remediation. Doesn't didn't grinding sound like remediation to you? Exactly. So so what that means is like the video game industry is training our kids to remediate over and over again, do constant repetitive tasks for little rewards and gains. Meaningless tasks, you know, incremental growth, rewards, and a goal. So, they're being trained that way. They're being programmed to grind. So you can say, hey, you know, we're gonna have to grind out that lesson. They'd be like, oh, okay, I guess I have to grind out that lesson. You know, instead of, hey, you, know, you gotta remediate the lesson. What the hell is a remediate? <laughs> yeah, so, so. Think about it that way. Grinding is remediation. So is farming. You know, farming is doing multiple tasks. It's another form of remediation. But you know, I want to make sure that you have to understand that gamification is not creating a video game. You know, a lot of people think you have to make it like a game, but it's not. It's using the principles. It's kind of like that math game. Did that math game look like a video game to you? Oh no. Where's the crazy sound effects, the graphics, the animations, the kapow wow? Doesn't exist because we're using all the psychological cues to make it addicting. Uh, and, a lot of, and there's actually nine scientific principles in there of learning that we would go over this afternoon. So here are the five steps uh, of gamification if you want to uh, try to start to think about how you want to gamify. I'm just gonna pull all five slides up. Uh, five points up, you know, know the audience, know your students, define a clear learning objective, and why. You know, the why is very important, you know, relevance, you know, Everything we want to say is like, you know, what is the relevance to what we're learning? We have to structure, I need water, no water. Uh, we structure the experience with the goal in mind. Identify resources. Now this is the hardest task. It's like, you know, picking up the things that you need to accomplish that goal. You know, whether it be lessons, uh, material, um, media, and things like that. But the, the, uh, the most important thing is that we have something that's fluid and intuitive. Oh, oh thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh, you, you could have opened enough for me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 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 
I appreciate that. Cool. Um, so yeah, it's a fluid, you know, to allow each choice, allowing them to be able to approach it from multiple angles. Yeah. It's so hard to do that because we have our rigid lessons, we have our rigid structure, so, you know, it's, 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 but it's something that uh, needs to be developed. Okay, so the, the last few slides here I'm going to show you is about game preference. So, you know, there's a ton of game, uh, game genres out there, and they're tailored to certain personality types. First one is FPS, which stands for First Person Shooter. The most popular type out there, you know, Halo, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, Overwatch, those are written in now, um, Fortnite. Actually, it's called a third person shooter, that's still the same. Basically, you have a gun and you're shooting people at a distance and doing damage and destruction. So you think that, you know, these kids, you know, violence in video games, right? Aggressive, bullies, vindictive, you know, they're, they're contribute to the mass shootings. But, you know, um, I'm a first person player shooter. Are you a first person player? You have a few out there. Are you gonna do that? Nope. 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 Maybe. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> but the thing is, <laughs> um, but the key thing is, you gotta think these kids who are playing these games are highly perceptive. They're team players, you know, if you're playing capture the flag, you can't just go and off on your own, you have to coordinate with other players and make sure that, you know, you're overwhelming the other team and better than fast reactions. You know, you're watching these screens and you're looking at all the different pixels. You've got sound cues, you've got visual cues, you've got, you got your indicators for how much health, uh, shield, life, uh, your number of, your ammo and everything like that. And you, and you have to be very adaptive to the levels. So a lot of these levels, they change and, and rearrange and you have to um, be adapted to that. So that's first person shooter. Now this next one is the next most popular one, MMORPG, MORP which stands for Massively Multiplayer Online Roleplay Game. Um, emphasis on the massive. So World of Warcraft, the Day of the uh, Asians, uh, the Star Wars World Republic, and EVE are some of the popular ones. Um, Fortnite is not classified as a MMORPG because it's a, an RPG means that you're playing as a character and you're building it up over a long time period. So like you, know, you start at level one and you make it to level 40, and by the time you're level 40, you become uber powerful. <laughs> These kids, you know, think that you know they're the they're closet basement gamers. They're reclusive and passive. They're antisocial. They have long hair. Um, maybe has a body odor. I don't. Don't worry. Um, but you know, but the thing is, these kids are very intelligent. They're team players. You know, you have to work in squads. You have to work in groups. They have a high sense of economics, so they understand the value of every item they pick up. And they sell those items to merchants for other players for value and sometimes real money. So, so they and, and it's also based on supply and demand. So that value changes based on uh, time and also region. So sometimes you can go to a different server and then it will be worth more there. So there's a high uh, level of economic understanding there. They're goal oriented. They don't understand that you know they have if they start at level one and they want to become a warrior mage. They have to do these different things to become a gold warrior mage. So they have a career path decided for them in the beginning, like, I want to be this, so this is my path to get there. Oh, and they're digitally social, huge decision makers and planners. So other genres that uh, is in the slide deck that I'm not gonna talk about right now, because I'm gonna get to some really cool stuff, uh, is these over here. Um, fighter, RPG, R real time strategy, uh, Sims, like, uh, I love uh, SimCity, uh, and time wasters, which like, any candy crushers, uh, payday, or yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, so basically, I'm going to flip through these really quick here, and then, uh, then we have the Minecraft, which is like, we don't know what to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here, okay, so everyone, here, everyone knows Myers Briggs, right? Yeah. So um, you, you know uh, you're Myers Briggs. I am an INTJ. Uh, so if you know who you are, there's this really cool website that actually uh, correlates that to gaming. So me, I am a visionary mastermind. <laughs> which actually fits my personality type in. Um, so if you look at it, if you click on each one, it's gonna describe what kind of games you like and, and like, you know, and things like that. So if you have your sense take the Meyer Briggs test, you can pull them up to this website and say, okay, this is your personality type, these are the kind of games you like, and then basically based on that understanding, you can start to understand the kind of uh, lessons you can build for them uh, based on the personality type. So, so like, you know, are they like, you know, first person shooters, are they, 
Uh, for RPGs, are they time wasters? But well, okay, everyone wants that. Uh, so, well, I guess too fast. Uh, so the other one is like this really cool website called Quantic Foundry. There's this like survey that you can take on there. So you can take it and have your students take it. And what it does is it analyzes based on the games and the things you like. Oh, okay, I'll move back so you can take the picture. So take two. Oops. You good? You good? Why you close? Um, so what this is is after you take the the, uh, the quiz, it'll give you a uh, a chart here based on your answers. And and basically what I am is I, I like action immersion type games, but I'm not very creative <laughs> apparently. So it gives you an analysis, and it's another tool to analyze your, yourself and your students in the class uh, to see like you know what what um, based on their game preferences where they gravitate towards. So it's a really cool resource to have as well. So, uh, so to help you learn something today, but in this session, I have a few minutes for Q and A if you like. Uh, we, we're good. We're here till eleven thirty, I think. But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. I hope you learned something amazing today. And yes, I did. But our kids are too. Thank you. <laughs>